I'm Daniel Zaleski. I'm the uh, features editor of The New Yorker. And this is Jane McGonigal. Uh, when people think of online entertainment, they often think of it as escapism. People shedding their dreary first life for a second life or becoming a dragon slayer or a space warrior in some kind of multi massively multiplayer shoot 'em up. But Jane McGonigal, pioneer in the era of alternate reality games, and that's an important term, is trying to bring online game playing a little bit away from escapism and toward engagement. We've already seen how the blogosphere and text messaging can really politically mobilize people, bring them together in a meaningful social way, and even force corporations and governments to respond to their concerns. Can these two worlds somehow be intertwined? Can the allure of gameplay be a force that draws people together? And can the goal of gameplay somehow be not getting a high score, but actually social change? Now, you can be skeptical about that, but I think after you hear Jane talk about this, you'll be excited about the prospect of this world. Uh, Jane is a former employee at 42 Entertainment, which created the genre of alternate reality games, sort of online viral marketing efforts for films such as AI and the game Halo. Upon receiving a PhD in performance studies at Berkeley, she became a, a fellow at the uh, deliciously named Institute of the Future in Berkeley, I mean, in Silicon Valley. And uh, last year, she created the online experiment World Without Oil, in which players from all around the world for about uh, 30 days imagined a global shortage of crude. And through everything from email uh, postings to online forums to blogs to Flickr pages, posted both sort of di dire scenarios and uh, potential solutions to a problem that one day we uh, may well, well might face. So anyway, welcome, uh, Jane McGonigal. Hi. Good morning, everybody. So I'm with the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. And for those of you who haven't heard of us, we're the oldest forecasting organization in the world. Um, we've been operating for 40 years. Um, and we like to think of ourselves as the only forecasting organization that has outlived, successfully outlived uh, most of our forecasts, um, which means you can hold us accountable for being actually useful or correct um, when talking about the future. Um, but something important to know about IFTF is that we don't try to predict the future. That's really hard and not that productive. And what we try to do instead is understand the materials of the future. Because if you understand the materials of the future, you can help shape the future. And that's way more important than trying to predict the future. Building a best case scenario future that we believe in and, and building the world we want to live in, that's what understanding the future is all about. So I'm here today to talk to you about what I think will be one of the most important materials for the future, and that is massively multiplayer gaming. Now, my area of expertise in gaming has to do with the intersection of games with reality, how the games that we play can actually change the way we live our real lives. And so I'm going to talk to you today about some leading edge game genres and some interesting signals of weird stuff happening in 2008 that show us a path towards a future in which instead of building really attractive alternatives to reality, building virtual worlds that we kind of like better than our boring real lives, we're going to move towards building a reality that works more like our favorite games so that we're more engaged with the real world. Um, but I should say that one of our core methodologies at IFTF is that um, in order to understand the future, you have to look back at least twice as far as you're trying to look forward. So I'm going to kind of do that at extreme scale today and take us back almost 3,000 years to um, the earliest recorded history of gaming. So um, Herodotus, the ancient Greek historian, um, some consider him the father of history, he was really interested in writing about the invention of gaming. So this is ancient dice from ancient kingdom of Lydia, which is like where Turkey is today. And uh, they used knuckle bones like from sheep as dice. And then they wound up making them square eventually. It's kind of interesting. But Herodotus wrote about the invention of gaming as being fundamentally a response to social crisis. Um, there was an 18-year famine in Lydia. And his history of that kingdom talked about how dice games were invented so that on alternate days, people throughout the kingdom would eat 
and then they would play games. And on the days that they were playing games, they would be so immersed in their games, they wouldn't have to eat. And so his history says that for 18 years, they passed eating and playing games on alternate days, the entire society. Um, now, some people today think that this might be apocryphal, that that's not the true origins of uh, dice games. But Herodotus' philosophy of history was that we can find moral problems and moral truths in the concrete data of experience. And I think there are four really important moral problems and moral truths in what he said about the invention of dice gaming. The first is that gameplay is about immersion, but it's not the immersion you might think about if you think about contemporary video games or computer games. It's not about immersing yourself in a story or graphics or fantasy. It's actually about immersing yourself in an interactive system and your engagement with that system and your engagement with other people playing games. That's the core focus of gameplay, and that was what enabled people to not eat, to be so immersed with other people, and to be immersed in the system of the game. It also shows us that games can be a constructive response to a social problem. Now, we haven't done a lot of that over the past 3,000 years, but it's something I'm interested in, this idea that we could create games that try to address a social problem. It also shows us that games may have been invented to alleviate suffering. Um, so I do a lot of talking to other game designers and game developers, and an idea that's really catching on now in the game industry is the idea that games are the ultimate happiness engine. We play them because when we're playing a game, we're not suffering. And that's absolutely in the kernel uh, of, uh, at the truth of this um, Herodotus story of invention of gaming, that when we play games, we're not suffering. Why aren't we trying to make games today that help alleviate suffering? Um, it also has this moral kernel of truth about games feeding a kind of hunger. But I think the hunger that we have today that's resulting in us spending so much time and money on games is a hunger for engagement. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit more. This is a quote from Ted Castronova, who's a great, brilliant economist, and it uh, sums up years of his work. We are witnessing what amounts to no less than a global mass exodus to virtual worlds and other online gaming environments. Um, the average uh, massively multiplayer online uh, gamer spends 24 hours a week in their virtual universe. Um, it's a $50 billion industry, and the time that people are spending in games, particularly people under 30, is growing. The chart looks like, I don't have the chart, but the chart looks like shoom, this. It's amazing. Um, particularly in developing countries, when they, um, uh, so China, for instance, is having a really interesting explosion. And I couldn't help but think during Amy Smith's talk yesterday about um, how people who are self-sufficient in terms of farming and they spend all their time basically trying to survive, um, and that in our society today we have this tremendous surplus of time um, because we're not just trying to survive. And as countries move um, you know, into this sort of developing stage, this massive cognitive surplus that we have. That's Clay Shirky's term, by the way. Um, little tip, if you haven't read Clay Shirky's brand new essay on cognitive surplus, make a mental note and Google that. Um, but so we have this cognitive surplus. We're desperate for something that is similar to the struggle to engage, the struggle to survive. So um, this is a piece of graffiti in my neighborhood. Um, it says, I'm not good at life. And it's interesting. We've become so good at surviving that we can feel not good at life because there's nothing for us to do or conquer in the same way that when our species was evolving really took all of our, our strength and courage um, and, and applying our, our, ourselves collectively to a problem. And I think this really captures what a lot of gamers feel like um, about games today, that they're not good at their real lives the way they're good at their games. So this is World of Warcraft, um, which um, everybody should be thinking a lot about because it's the best design reality of all time, basically. Um, and what's great about it is the minute you log on to the game, first of all, you have a display of all the people who want to be your allies. They want to collaborate with you. They want to help you. You have a clear mission. You have a purpose. And it, it's important because there's a narrative around the importance of your quest. And you're getting constant real-time feedback about levels that you're achieving and talent points that you're amassing and just an incredible amount of information all designed to make you feel like a hero, to help you collaborate with other people and to make you successful. We don't have these kinds of displays, these kinds of alliances in real life. And for people who play these games, it's really discouraging. They want real life to work more like this game. And there are four things we can think about for why these games are more compelling than real life today. And, and it's all operating within what I call the economy of engagement. The first is they give you satisfying work to do. They give you the experience of being good at something. They give you time spent with people you like. 
In this case, it's time online, but the kind of games that I make are also about time face to face in the real world. And finally, they give you the chance to be a part of something bigger, to feel like you're a part of a, of a system that's bigger, of a narrative arc that's bigger. And these are really the four components of happiness.、Um, I don't have time today to talk about my positive psychology research, but as a game designer, I'm using psychological principles, and these are the four things that we think really make people happy. So here's a future forecast. Within the next five years, we're going to find ourselves increasingly living our real lives inside of massively multiplayer games. But they're not going to be the ones that are online in a 3D virtual environment. They're going to be games that are in the real world, in our airports, and in our hospitals, and in our schools, and on our subways. So let me show you some of the technology that's going to make this possible. And I'm going to move pretty quickly, but just、um, I'll put these slides online, and you can. Can look at it later.、Um, so, first of all, if you've ever driven a Prius, you know that there's incredible technology being embedded in our automotive industry that gives us real-time information about how we're doing. This is a blog where some girl is saying that her car is a video game, and really, miles per gallon is like the new high score. So, in in our everyday lives, we're suddenly immersed in systems that tell us what our goals are and how we can improve. This is an amazing game called Chore Wars. It's an MMO for doing chores in real life. You sign up with your roommates or with your office mates or with your family, and you get experience points. And every chore you do around your house or office is、um, is an adventure quest. It's awesome.、Um, there are tons of companies now and VCs everywhere investing in、um, sensor-based exercising games. Um, so. Uh, So, for instance, Nike Plus. You know, it's in your shoe. It knows how fast you're going. Maybe social networks know who you're running with. You go out and quest in real life.、Um, lots of games are happening on mobile phones now. You're getting missions on your phone, telling you to do stuff in the real world, often with GPS coordinates attached, so that other people show up at the same space. Shark Runners、um, is an example of a game happening right now, where they put. GPS tags on real sharks, and so when you're playing this online game, you're playing with real sharks swimming around in the ocean. That's crazy and awesome. <laughs> Sniff tags is a dog collar. It's a social network for dogs, and、uh, it tracks other dogs that you meet in real life. How fast the dogs are moving, whether they're sitting, it knows if they're rolling or fetching. It's great.、Um, I have a dream of building an MMO where your dog is your avatar, and so when you have to go on a big quest together, you need to get the dachshund, and you have to get Kali, and you have to get the mutt, and you all go do this thing together. And it knows how fast you're moving and where you are.、Um, Trackstick is a device that takes a, a GPS recording of your position on the Earth every 30 seconds, so it knows the path that you trace, and you plug it into your computer, and it displays on Google Earth and Google Maps. Imagine the kind of bigger-than-life journeys we could go on if we were、um, sort of using this with Google Earth instead of a simulated environment. And finally, this is a dry neurotransmitter. It's really cheap, 20 bucks. You buy it. it Reads your attention, your focus, your arousal. People are already making video games where you, you know, destroy people by telekinetically focusing on them,、um, or everybody has to calm down and relax in order to win the game. So、um, within this space,、um, there's a group of designers called alternate reality game designers. I'm one of them. I like to think of these as the vanguard of reality hacking、uh, people. We're trying to change reality. We're using all these technologies to make games that sit on top of the real world. I don't have time to go into the genre too much today,、um, but if you're interested, the concept alternate reality comes from science fiction. There's an OED for science fiction citations.、So、I imagine there are a lot of writerly. Word geeky people in the audience.、Um, so the OED for science fiction citations is really awesome,、um, and this is one of the early citations of the term from 1978. An alternate reality is another way of experiencing existence. So what I'm proposing and what a lot of designers are doing is making games that live on top of a real world, so even alternate, better, more engaging way of experiencing reality.、Um, and I think in our Q and A, I'll get to have a chance to talk a little bit about some of the games we've made.、Sure. So let's let's do Q and A. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the game that I wanted to talk with you about at first was、uh, World Without o- Oil. Let's sort of、uh, you know go back a year to when this game starts.、Um, Jane, your role officially was that of the、uh, puppet master for this yeah, game. Yeah. Let's imagine that you click on the、uh, the homepage for World Without Oil. What happens in this alternate world, and how is it fun? Great. Yeah.、Um, can we bring the slides back up? So、um, when you Came to the World Without Oil website. What you found was a kind of alternate reality dashboard. We told you that there was a global oil shortage, and we asked you to sign up and tell us where you lived.、Um, and it was 
but basically focused on the U.S. because it was funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, but we had global players as well. And then you would get this information about the fuel prices, fuel availability, um, and other metrics like um, in your region, what was the level of chaos versus stability, um, quality of life versus misery, and economic impacts. And every day we would update this, and what we would ask you to do was create content telling us what you thought your life would be like in this world, and to actually live your real life as if the shortage were true. So what people did is um, they started creating media as if this alternate reality were true. So this is a soldier in Iraq who blogged the entire game about what it would be like to be a soldier in Iraq during an oil shortage. It's fascinating. Um, we had people making YouTube videos. This was a guy who went around modding other players' cars and trucks to be biodiesel fueled, but they were like really doing it as if we'd actually had an oil shortage already. Um, people were doing man-on-the-street interviews, they were doing podcasts, they were doing manga, they were doing real-world meetups, um, and doing kind of cool web art. Um, and the idea here was for 32 days, 1,800 players lived their real lives as if we were in an oil shortage. And what was fun about it is that you were in this community of people who were riled up, you were passionate, um, it was exactly like um, the discussion of the tiger in the cage this morning, which is actually one of my favorite theories, uh, Michael Apter's theory of safe play frames with um, the tiger in the cage metaphor. And they were basically experiencing the drama of an oil shortage, but in a safe way, because it wasn't true yet. And um, at the end of it, we had architects who had figured out what architecture would be like in a world without oil. We had a lot of young people talking about dating in a world without oil. Um, my mother's without oil. But my favorite was NASCAR enthusiasts for a world without <laughs> oil. They were scared but innovative. Um, so, so you're talking about vegetable fueled fuel Formula One? or what? Yeah, what yeah, like? yeah. And what would it take to, how long would it take for the... Um, Mm -hmm. the sport to transform. Um, but the cool thing is if you go to worldwithoutoil.org now, it's all archived, all the stuff that people created. So you can see it's like an immersive archive. And so if I can segue into one more forecast, sure. um, it would be by 2018, Projects like World Without Oil um, are teaching people this kind of extreme scale collaboration. This is like Wikipedia, but supercharged, um, because it takes a lot of effort to coordinate an alternate reality. So, you know, my forecast is that extreme scale collaboration becomes mm -hmm. the most important human ability, and that massively multiplayer collaboration, trying to save the real world through these game structures, will become kind of the new modus operandi for nonprofits, for governments, for anybody, you know, grassroots trying to change the world. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, you know, we, people come to conferences like this to sort of say, let's pool our brain power and sort of see what kind of solutions we have. I guess the idea is that that can't hold a candle to sort of a competitive game in which yeah. everyone's trying to say, what would we do if, say, we actually yeah. had no oil? And I should say, World Without Oil, though, is collaborative. It's also competitive because what you're doing is you're trying to create the most persuasive media. So, you know, um, one player wrote a text for a State of the Union address of the new... Um, Secretary of State, but another player actually recorded a podcast of a different State mm -hmm. of the Union address, and that person's podcast became the accepted reality um, because it was more persuasive. So people are outdoing themselves to create this really compelling media, and um, so, so you do have the benefit of competition, which is important to games, um, but essentially the entire project is collaborative. Mm -hmm. Well, if uh, somebody would like to uh, enter one of your worlds and sort of see what it's like um, to engage in this, you know, do you have any games going right now that yeah. people can... Yeah, so the keywords to remember, the lost ring, like a ring. Um, I'm doing a project uh, for the Olympics right now, okay. and uh, this is an alternate reality in which an ancient lost sport has been rediscovered. Nobody knows how to play it, so anybody who's ever dreamed of being an Olympic champion this is your time, because nobody knows how to play it, so nobody's good at it yet. Anybody can be an Olympic champion. The idea was to transform the Olympics from being basically a passive, vicarious experience for most people into an active one. And we're taking people to Beijing to play the sport on the Olympic lawn, um, so making a, you know, a better alternate reality of the Olympics. TheLostRing.com. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you very much, Jane. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.